All right, welcome to Script Camp's TV Pilot Bootcamp Week 1. If you're just joining us, we've only had one previous class in this course series, which was the Week 0 class. Both of these are free and open to the public, and the Week 0 is a good place to go and get the kind of broad overview of everything that will be included in the class, and also to maybe get that early feedback on your log lines, even if you just have a basic idea for what the log line could be. So for next time, if you missed it, check the week before the course starts and there will always be that kind of week zero prep class to give you a little extra head start. So here's the buttons that you need to press to speak aloud. It's the hand icon that says request to speak and then once you are requested to speak you'll have to click accept invite. <coughs> if you're on a mobile device like a tablet or phone you might have to turn the device to the side to see those buttons. So this is uh, script camp. This was the first of our skill camp servers and is currently our biggest one with over 4,000 members. Um, we're growing all the time and adding new sort of communities. We have many different class servers that offer free and low cost classes to help you learn new skills and reach your life goals. Skill camp is a nonprofit company that started with script camp, but we've since added things like word camp for novel writing, tune camp for animation, code camp for coding, lingo camp for language learning, and many more. Um, I've been writing full-length scripts for 11, 12 years, got signed for the first time in 2017 off of a feature script. Since then, the only uh, the um, only credit that you guys might recognize would be Creep Show, which was a TV show anthology from 2019 that I wrote an episode of, um, placed in a few contests and fellowships that you can see here. I've had some features set up in uh, production companies in town, and I teach the boot camps and weekly writers lab. Um, we have multiple times a week for table reads, which is where you can submit your script to be read by the community and to get feedback from them. That's going to be Sunday at 2 p.m., so that's later today, 2 p.m. Pacific time, Tuesday at 11 a.m., and Saturday at 2 a.m. Pacific time, which is our international time slot, which should be more accessible to people around the world. We also, on WordCamp, which is our pro server, we have two times a week a reading and critique session as well. That's going to be Saturday, 7 p.m., and Thursday at 10 a.m. So there's plenty of things going on every month with over 100 hours of events, classes, workshops, and other things on all of our different servers. Um, you can see the upcoming boot camp schedule here. This one today is going to be running Sundays 10 to noon for the next six weeks. So there's five classes after this, um, with the idea being that you finish your pilot by the end of the week that follows the final class. Feature boot camp started last week. It's not too late to join, but I would join by this upcoming class if you have not yet done so. I'd usually recommend joining before class two. That's running Fridays, 6 to 8 p.m. Pacific time. And we have Novel Boot Camp running Saturdays, 12 to 2. That one's half done. It's been going for a while. It's okay to join any time, but it's unlikely you'll be able to catch up with the class that's been writing a book for, you know, six months or, or six weeks or more. But in any case, you don't have to follow along any particular benchmarks or milestones. You can work at your own pace, join those whenever you want, and that's running all the way through the end of January. We also have Weekly Writers Lab, which is like an office hour session that you can come in Saturday 4 to 6 p.m. at any point. You can bring up to five pages of anything you're working on in terms of screenplays, fiction, outlines. You can bring questions and topics that you'd just like to hear more about. And otherwise, just bring anything you're working on for feedback as long as it is doable within the 15 to 20 minutes sort of time. Um, if you jo plan to join the TV Boot Camp, there's a poll in the chat, which you can see there. You can click the numbers. Uh, number one means you plan to sign up. You, there's also numbers to click on that indicate you have questions or you aren't sure or anything else. So look in the chat there. If you plan to sign up, you can let us know and you'll get instant access to all of the member-exclusive chat channels. And if you're looking to sign up and would like to know where to go, you can head to scriptcamp.net. There you can sign up just right there off the main page for unlimited membership which includes access to every single class, workshop, and event on every server, not just Script Camp, so you don't have to get the memberships separately or individually. You can just sign up for uh, Script Camp, and that will give you access to Word Camp, Film Camp, Code Camp, Tune Camp, Creator Camp, Design Camp, Lingo Camp, and our new one, Game Camp, which we only have one recurring event on so far, but we're going to be adding more events, more meetups and sessions on our game design-focused server, too. Membership also includes access to the video library, which includes recordings of every previous class, huge discounts off consultations and proofreads, and you also get access to the member-exclusive chat channels and weekly writer's lab and advanced lab sessions, which are just for our unlimited members. So definitely, if you're thinking about joining classes like this and you want to persist past just the opening three weeks, then you should sign up for unlimited 
um, you can sign up for yearly and save 40%. All right, so um, let's move on. We're going to look at the overview of this course, which is running until January 21st. So that gives us until the new year, and the Christmas holiday is going to kind of boost out the duration of this class a little bit. But um, last week, we started with just very basics of premise and logline and looking ahead at what it, what does TV writing look like in America? How do you get a job as a TV writer? What does this actually take and require? What does the career actually look like? And what are some of the basic elements of this that you're going to have to remember and work with? This week, we're looking at story engines. So we'll be talking more about engines and what makes a TV show actually feel like it could generate stories for potentially years and years of content which the story engine is that kind of amalgamation of several different elements that are going to sort of sum up to feeling like a um, a show. Like, it feels like it can... It's going to be more than just a movie. It's going to be more than just two hours of content. It's either going to be a long story that will unfold one chapter at a time, or it's going to be a series of potentially unlimited stories that kind of reset to the status quo every week. And every week we might expect a new, one-off, self-contained story within that world. But those are basically your options in terms of continuity format, and your show story engine needs to make it clear that you your show is either one or the other of those um, options. So this week we're looking at story engines and loglines again. So if you have early versions of your logline that you got feedback on last week, you can bring back the revisions today to get that second pass. If this is your first time joining, then um, you can also get feedback on your logline, and I would expect... In most cases, we run the first hour as lecture and setup and prep, and the second hour is mostly dedicated to giving feedback on log lines. So don't just drop your log line in the chat at any point because it will get lost in the text. It will be better if you wait until about the halfway mark, and then I will ask for, okay, now everyone share your log lines, and I will go through them in order and try to get through as many as I can. It's not 100% guaranteed to get through every single one, um, so if you're a little slow on the quick draw in that case, then you might want to um, bring the logline to lab instead, where you can always bring whatever you want for feedback, or you can post it on one of our many feedback um, chat channels this week and get that feedback from the community. But in, in any case, today is a good time to just sort of check in on the essentials of your idea, see does this feel like it could work as a TV show? Um, and beyond that, we won't spend way too long on recapping all the different elements of TV writing and stuff like we did last week. I'd rather spend today more on the craft elements of what makes a really good story engine, what is a story engine, and how does that kind of work, and then giving additional feedback and refinement to the log lines that you may be adjusting more as of last week, or maybe you scrapped the one you had last week and you have an entirely new one. Whatever you want to do today is the day to get that feedback and to try, if you app, if by any way you can, by hook or by crook, if you can, to finalize that log line by the end of this weekend. If not, then as soon as you can in the next couple days, because pretty soon you have to just start outlining. Um, and it's okay if you adjust your logline as you go, or if you need to change it at the end or anything else, but it's helpful to have that really strong guiding sentence that will help act as a North Star to keep you oriented properly and prevent you from drifting too far from your original ideas. <clears throat> so next week is outlining. Outlining one, we're breaking the story. We are writing up story beats, which is a general list of every major scene in your script. Next week after that, week 3, December 10th, we're doing scene cards. So you're expanding the story beats into a full paragraph for every single scene, along with a title for that scene and a page number that that scene is going to take place on. So we're kind of estimating how long each scene will take and how many pages it will require with an eye towards um, building our sense of pacing for the show. And, and as we're working through using that outline to work from, we're going to be able to assess accurately, am I taking too long on any one part or am I rushing through the story beats? So the ascribing page numbers to each section or to each scene card is um, a form of almost hyper preparation, you might say, or you might see it that way. But to me, it makes it really easy to keep uh, keep a c close eye on your pacing as you're working through the episode. So it's worth doing, and it doesn't take that much more work at the beginning. But you notice that we do spend three weeks on prepping and figuring out what happens in the story. So if you figure out what the show is from a very zoomed out perspective. Then you sort of zero in on what would just this pilot logline, just this first story be. And then we're going to spend the first half of the course just figuring out what happens in every scene and then what happens on every single page. So by the time you start, you'll never be lost because you know what happens on every page of the story and you have this really clear and concise roadmap that should lead you all the way through from beginning to end. And if you're writing half hour, that's only going to require you to write about 
uh, two pages a day on just weekdays once we start the actual writing. On December 17th, that's when you will start the script, and that's going to be, from then on, an act a week. So first act, week four, second act, week five, third act, week six. So that is going to conclude January 21st. You notice that the holidays are in the middle there, so we do have that Christmas week off. Um, but in any case, that will give you extra time. So you have that extra buffer. This will give you, you know, probably around eight weeks total, maybe even nine if we count week zero, to write and finish your TV script all the way to the end, which is plenty of time. Um, if you still need to enroll, make sure you do sign up before next class. You can do that at scriptcamp.net. Um, if you just want to stick around for today's intro class, then you do not need to sign up for that. All right, that's the overview of everything coming up. Let's jump right into ground rules and looking at the kind of table of contents for today's class. So we'll start with just a little info on types of ideas to choose and, and recapping some of the essential suggestions at the very beginning of the process before we move into log lines and story engines. So story engine is not one sort of field that you fill out. It's not one single sentence. A log line is simple because it's one sentence, right? A story engine is kind of an amorphous conglomeration of different elements. It's like um, a combination of everything that goes into your show that make it feel like this could run for years of interesting stories. So we will look at some of the individual aspects of story engine today. We'll talk quick recap on time slot format and genre uh, we did and continuity, which we went over last week. So by now, assuming you were in last class, you should have a pretty clear idea of what the difference between a premise versus status quo show is, what the different time slot options are, and what the different page counts that you're going for are going to be, but we will just very briefly touch on those again today. We will look more at filling out Sketchbook, which is going to be your goal for next week, is to completely fill out as much as you can the rest of your Sketchbook for the project. And then second hour, we will do, be doing pretty much all log lines. So I would be working on your log line during this first hour of class. I would have your Sketchbook open in another tab or on your screen and just be writing down questions that you have or things that you're unsure about, adding ideas or images or links to articles or any research information that you might need. And otherwise, just instead of you know playing Candy Crush on your phone, you just have the sketchbook open and be adding to it actively, working on it throughout the class, even as you're just listening to the rest. We have a chat from Sinzenal, or we have a chat, a comment from Sinzenal on YouTube saying, will my comments be seen inside of YouTube chat? Uh, yeah, they'll show up on the YouTube uh, live, and they will also be visible to us here on Discord. So if you're watching from one of our different platforms, like YouTube, Twitch, or Twitter, you can hang out there, and your comments should be visible to us, though they sometimes take uh, an extra minute or two for us to see. Or you can come join us on Discord, which you can find the link by just going to scriptcamp.net. And then you can actually participate in the class, ask questions, bring your log lines, and other things like this. But no matter where you're watching it, this should be this is free and public and will be available to watch back after the fact. So YouTube is the easiest place to do that. So just go to our YouTube page, click on the list of previous live events, and you should find all of our other free live classes. Okay, um, so at that second at that second half of the class, at the halfway mark, we will post and share log lines. Um, but I would not post and share it until then, because otherwise they will kind of get lost. Because we have so much to do today, and we already kind of did a couple check-ins with folks last week um, on just the essentials of your goals. Feel free to weigh in in the text chat if you want to, but I'm not going to take a raised hands on this at the moment. Um, maybe tell us about yourself. What are you hoping to write? What are your goals? How many pilots have you read before? Or what are your favorite ones? Maybe you have a favorite TV writer or favorite genre. Something that you're trying to write something sort of like. Maybe that's the case, or maybe this is your first time ever. You have no experience, and you can let us know that too. Feel free to type in the chat and introduce yourself if you've not already done so and I can read out a couple comments I'm going to give you guys just a second to do that as I go grab my laptop's power cord to plug it in <laughs> I will be right back um, and uh, if no one has posted then feel free in the next couple minutes to continue to add those in the chat and I will read them out as they come up
All right, I am back. Looks like a few people are typing, so you guys can finish your introductions in the chat as you wish. I'm going to just you. So everyone who's typing, feel free to finish your comment. I'm just going to tell everyone else what to do next. So the next thing we're going to do is make your sketchbook. So if you've not already done this, you would just go to Google Docs and make a blank document. There's really nothing fancy or special or uh, complicated about this. You will make a blank document, and at the top, you'll just make a couple fields for these questions that we have or these things that we're going to try to make decisions on today if possible if not then in this upcoming week we have title genre format slash time slots comps series logline and pilot logline I, I will leave this up so you guys can write all these things down nacho has also shared in the chat thank you nacho a curated list of pilot scripts in our various different genre libraries so, so you can see um, you can search uh, on th through this directory for scripts to read, and then there's also a great TV writing site. Um, there's a Google group for TV writing, which has a ton of pilots posted on it, um, where you can find plenty of scripts to read. So I'm going to post that in the chat as well. All right, let's see what the comments that we've received in the chat are, some introductions. Um, we hear from Vicky. Vicky says, my goals for the moment is being able to create an animation project that I can do on my own. Okay, cool, yep, so obviously you're going to um, find more resources for that for animation on Toon Camp, but in terms of writing the story for the animation, this was a fine place to start, especially if you're looking into writing sort of webisodes or episodic content like 10 minute web shorts or something like that a lot of the basic elements of tv writing will apply to that thank you vicky ginger says i'm trying to complete my very first screenplay and learn as much as i can along the way i'm transitioning from writing novels so it's been a big learning curve yes absolutely a lot of differences um between these different formats i did the opposite myself i approached writing novels coming from the background of screenwriting for movies and tv so i had to make the opposite journey and learn all those same quirks myself um but glad to have you with us and yep yeah, some of the some of the skills you build in one type of writing will definitely carry over or um help in other aspects um michael says haven't read as many pilots as i should have now that i think about it but breaking bad has been a favorite to read that's great yep classic great pilot to read plenty of other options i recommend reading uh three scripts a week um eden is saying the stream died i don't think this stream has died uh if somebody else can confirm nacho go ahead are you there nacho So we were not getting audio from him. Maybe his mic came unplugged or something like that. Can anyone else tell me? Is the stream uh, still going? Go can ahead. you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just on Eden's end, I think. So maybe she, if Eden tries to disconnect and reconnect, hopefully you can see it. It. The stream is visible, I think, for everyone else. Okay. Good to know. Thank you, Nacho. Uh, all right. Let's see what else. Aniket says, I'm from India. I've written one bad feature script before this. Goals are to complete a pilot episode. Great. Yep. You got to get the bad ones out of the way, out of the system before you can get to the good ones. So it's totally fine to write bad scripts. It's kind of your job to write bad scripts for a while. So now next goal, write a bad pilot and then another one and then another one. And then eventually you'll get to the good ones. Uh, Ginger says, I'm currently reading House of the Dragon pilot and been enjoying it a lot. Great, awesome. And Lech Luger says, I've been reading Westworld. Some more HBO fans in here to get more familiar with TV format. Yeah, that show, very very complicated, a lot going on in that show. So it's worth reading of a wide variety of both, you know, shows that are in different genres or have different size of cast, different size of ensemble, reading some shows that are very small and quiet and personal and reading some shows that are, you know, wall-to-wall -wall dialogue and things like this. It's good to have a very broad range of scripts that you read. And my suggestion is, again, three scripts a week. We will ask in every TV boot camp, what scripts, what pilots have you read this week? So that's a will always be a question, no matter where we are. So you must, you must keep the reading up, be consistent, take notes, pay attention, 
that you can't fall behind on the reading, especially if you've not really read pilots before. You're not going to write a good pilot unless you've read a lot of good pilots, so you must start the reading. Luke says, I'm not sure how to introduce myself. I'll go with Art Weirdo. Okay, too many favorite writers to mention. He likes Vince Gilligan, Alex Garland. His primary goal is to get to the second or chapter 21 of his novel draft by January 16th. Okay, great. So, yeah, focused on a novel project instead of a TV project for now, but you can always drop by the other classes if you want. Um, we have another comment. I'm coming from the world of skit writing, so this is all new to me, but this sounds like a lot of fun. Great, yeah, so... Uh, skit is just a really, really, really short film, right? Like a three-minute long sketch. Um, there's going to be, you know, if you're writing comedy fe- comedy pilots or things like that, then the ability to write really good sketches will carry over. Improv and stand-up and these other skills will always contribute to your ability to write funny lines in any comedy writing. So a lot of crossover there, for sure. Um, and Luke tells us that his least favorite pilot is by a writer he otherwise en- enjoys... Linwood Boomer's Americanized Red Dwarf Pilot. Okay, well, uh, sure, if you've got a, a least favorite, um, that tell, at least tells us that you're reading a lot. Um, so that's a good sign. Red Dwarf being a very famous English show. These American remakes that were all the rage in the like early 2000s, not always big hits. Uh, all right, so um, make sure to fill, all the, fill out or write down all these things at the top of your sketchbook title, genre, format, slash, time slot, comps, series logline, and pilot logline. And as you assess the answers or you decide the answers or whatever it is, try to fill out the those fields today. So once you think of a title, you fill in the title. Once you can figure out what genre you're writing, you fill that out, etc. So we're going to be writing a pilot in six weeks. Is the draft going to be good? No. Don't expect it to be good and don't require it to be good for you to be satisfied and happy with it because your first ever painting is not usually going to get hung in the museum, right? Um, so your first pilot is not going to go to TV, just like you, this is a, a proposition to create a large company that will move millions and millions of dollars and employ hundreds of people over the course of years. It's very unlikely that the, your first ever script will be out of the gate ready to be made into a $100 million TV show, right? Like that's saying, I'm ready to be a CEO on day one. So just try to um, uh, be realistic about your approach to this and about how wide the skill gap actually is. And keep in mind that it is it takes longer and is harder to do this than it is to become a professional athlete in terms of NBA, NFL, something like that. So you have to really commit to the long haul for this. It is not something you can casually or easily break into. It takes years and a lot of hard work and a lot of networking. And um, it is not for everyone. And if those things sound annoying or hard or difficult to you, this is definitely not for you. And this is a very, very social form of writing beyond all else. So keep in mind that you're not only working on these skills of how do I write a great story, but also these skills of like, how do I work with others better? How do I take and give feedback and things like this, which would just make you better in a room. So I would just look at stuff like this program and others on script camp or the other events and workshops and activities we have. on trying to become a TV writer. You're not trying to have written one thing. That's going to become an amazing multi-million dollar show, especially if it's within your first, I don't know, 20 scripts or whatever it's probably not going to sell and make you a lot of money or get you a career. So you have to accept and understand that each of these are going to be certain learning steps in a long journey that takes many years. Um, so try to get used to that. Try to get try to use these as an opportunity to work on these skills and to actually become a writer. Don't worry about someone who has written one good thing. Let's look at basic ground rules of, and suggestions of ideas to pick. So don't do true stories, anthologies, or adaptations. Nothing that's going to require a large amount of extra research that's going to slow you down and make it more difficult to write a script in six weeks, which is hard enough as it is. Don't write time travel. Just believe me. Just don't. We've never once seen a student successfully complete a time travel script in two years of running boot camps. Just don't do time travel. Don't do it. Um, We have this guideline of probably don't do a historical. It's rare that somebody is actually able to finish a historical if you consider that it takes extra research and work and time to do. So if you have some kind of background in that history, it might or that period, it might be easier for you. But in any case, it's recommended that you not. Beware of things that just make a script difficult to read or figure out on the page. Anything involving things like multiverses, clones, uh, complicated intertwined um, flashback structures, so different timelines, 
um, anything like that where it just becomes unclear who the characters are and what is going on. Those are kind of really advanced skills to learn, and I would not recommend writing them for a boot camp simply because you don't want the majority of feedback you get to be asking, like, wait, what happened? Wait, who is that? Wait, that's the same guy? I thought those were different guys. You're saying that's the same guy? I, I totally misunderstood the entire story. Like, you just don't want the audience to get hung up on the basic technical details of the time travel or the cloning devices or whatever it is that is going on in your script. So just be really careful about ideas like that, especially if you're just starting out. But in any case, take the take the time to take a big swing. Write something weird or interesting that you've never seen before. Just write, ever, write whatever you think would be some weird mashup of genres that you like, that you think would be cool and would keep you excited and engaged and interested to write for six to eight weeks. Um, that's the main goal, is to finish, to get to the end, to keep yourself motivated and interested and excited enough to finish the script within eight weeks. And really also get used to sharing work with me and uh, your other fellow peers and everyone, even at the early stages. It can be difficult to hear big notes at early stages, especially if you're like, this is my masterpiece, I can't share any of this or else people are going to steal it or people are going to um, copy my ideas or they're going to make fun of it and then I won't like it anymore or things like that. If you're working in TV staffs, remember how essential it is to share ideas even at the early stages. That's called just pitching ideas, right? And sometimes writers even have this thing they do where they're like, okay, bad pitch, it's going to be like this, right? So they start with an intention, they kind of set you up to understand that they're going to give you a bad version of the idea to begin with, with the expectation that the room will then collaborate to make that idea better in whatever way. But you can't be too attached to ideas to write in TV, you can't be too precious about them, and you can't be a control freak, considering this is an intensely collaborative and social medium where no matter who you are, at any level you have bosses... Uh, unless you're paying for the entire TV show yourself and you own the network and the studio or something like that. Maybe then you don't have bosses. But most of the time you have bosses and coworkers and a chain of command and a hierarchy and a structure and um, you have to fit into that well and not stick out and not be at the squeaky wheel and not annoy people or smell weird or look weird and throw everyone off, you know. So you kind of have to get used to spending long amounts of time in a room writing with other people and being pleasant to be around and easy to work with. These are more important things to be working on than, say, I need to write the next Game of Thrones that's going to make $100 million. So just that's just some tips for you. Uh, don't go in expecting your idea to blow everyone's mind. It takes a long time to get good at this, and this is hard work, um, and it requires a big investment of your life to have a career doing this. Okay, that aside, let's look at the five major steps of, that we go from idea to first draft. We start with logline, we move up into sketchbook, and usually I make the sketchbook first and then work on the logline in the sketchbook, so technically I guess you could say sketchbook maybe comes first, but in any case, logline, sketchbook, which is going to be your unsorted list of ideas, influences, inspirations, research, um, snippets of dialogue or ideas for characters, um, character profiles or a cast list, ideas for scenes or locations, rules of the world that you're building out or, or uh, anything else. Um, so just your sketchbook is to collect all of the ideas for this one project in one document. There are no real other rules of things you have to include besides just these basic questions, title, genre, format, comps, and the log lines. Um, after that, uh, the only other ground rule is after today's class, if you're continuing with the program, we ask that you not use a screen name and instead change to reusing your real name just like we have to do in the industry you're using your real name um you don't have to do that now if you that's just something for next week or if you're coming back for more classes you can right click on your name and click change nickname or i can do it for you if needed but in any case we if uh if you're serious about being a boot camper you'll use a real name or at least a nickname or middle name or something like that that is an actual name we don't like to be calling people you know fortnite player 420 uh in the boot camps Okay, um, so we ha start with logline, we go to sketchbook, we go to story beats, which are the, it's the kind of like the list of events in the episode, in the rough order that they're supposed to go in, but there can be some placeholders, there can be scenes missing, it doesn't have to be entirely complete. The scene cards, which are the next week, that's week three, we're going to expand those story beats to add more detail to them, so you're really sure what happens in every single scene. You're going to fill in all those placeholders and gaps and where any where a scene is missing. You're also going to make those decisions as to how many pages each scene is going to require. Therefore, you're going to be able to build out a really comprehensive picture of what's happening on every single page of your either 30-page or 60-page pilot. 
So, um, I think that before I get too into log lines, I do want to start with story engine. Actually, you know what? Maybe I'll give the format for the log line and then go into story engine so you guys have that to kind of uh, uh, copy down on your own paper if you want to. And um, you can then be working on that as we're continuing the, the, continuing the discussion. So I'm just going to leave you with this for now. This is the pilot logline template. You don't have to use exactly this every single time, but these are kind of like the basic questions that you need to try to answer in the logline and that people are going to be wondering about the script, right? So you um, can think of it going a little something like this. When or after inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes. It might be a little bit more like or else stakes or until stakes, or it might be, uh, any number of variations on this, right? You don't have to use exactly this. But if you don't know what else to do and you're not sure where to start, then you should start with this because this is going to force you to do a couple things. One, decide what event is actually kicking off the story. That's sometimes known as the catalyst or the inciting incident interchangeably. So that's the same story beat we're talking about. An adjective protagonist tells us who your main character is in terms of what specific tactic do they use or maybe what limitation are they facing or maybe what trait do they have that makes them the right person to go through this story. So you have to choose the adjective kind of carefully. Don't just pick the first thing that comes to your mind. And also the way that you describe the character should also be make them feel like they are the right person for this story. So people are a lot of things, right? A character might be a determined cop, but also a um, uh, neglectful parent, right? Like they, we could describe the same character as both of those things, depending what the story requires or what is going to be, what aspect of that character is going to be challenged in that story, we might want to pick one or the other, right? So you have to kind of choose your adjective and noun to make them feel like they click within this story and like it is a cohesive idea. Um, what else? Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna leave that up um, just for another second so you guys can write that down if you need to, if you're not sure what the pilot log line looks like or what to be kind of working on as I continue to talk about engines and things like this. But write this down now, remember this, burn this into your brain uh, when or after inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes. The series logline can be a little bit more abstract, a little bit longer term, and is going to be giving us like the types of situations that are going to be coming up throughout the entire show. Um, so if you can, if you only run, want to work on one today, I would recommend the pilot over the series. But in any case, your goal is ultimately to have both of these. So try to fill out both of them if you can. I'm going to go more into uh, story engine before I get more into series loglines because series loglines need to really clarify and amplify the story engine and make it very clear how this is going to be a show more than how is this going to be just one single movie right okay so um, I'm going to go into story engine before we touch on series logline so what is a story engine it's a combination of several elements that sum up to create the conflict in your show that will sustain a an entire theoretical series that, again, you won't probably get, so don't worry too much about it being perfect, right? 99.9% .9 of pilots are not going to become multi-million dollar productions, so don't go in thinking, okay, but maybe mine. Um, but you have to always be sort of in this theoretical mode, right, where these pilots are a representative sample of something that doesn't exist and won't probably exist, but feels like it could support a show. So the story engine should be clear from the series logline alone, but if not the series logline alone, then at least looking at both of the loglines together. It's, a, it's going to be fusing your character, story world, and situation all together to continually generate conflict. A strong story engine is going to suggest potentially uh, 100 hours of television, or at least within the scope of what you're trying to do, right? Like if your whole show is going to take place within five years, we might kind of imagine that's going to be a five-year TV show, like where every season of real life or every season that we run in real life more or less corresponds to a year in the show. Maybe that is kind of how you are planning it, in which case your story engine should include that sense of where the walls, limitations, or otherwise the finish line of the story will be. If there isn't one, and remember there does not need to be a finish line uh, to a TV show, it could just sort of be like, here's the setup, here's the situation, this feels like it could go on forever. That's fine, but then in that case, you need to adequately explain what types of situations and conflicts the characters will be running into and how the dynamic between them is going to dramatically sustain a very long narrative. So um, let's look at a description of the story engine for The Office. 
So again, it says the story engine is not one concrete thing. It's not just like the story engine is this one sentence, right? It's a combination of different things and different people might view them in slightly different ways. But this is my interpretation of what is the story engine for The Office, which is, I think, one of the most popular shows of all time, I would guess. Um, and so I think that a lot of people will know the essentials of who these characters are, right? So let's start with the protagonist. The protagonist being the sort of centerpiece character of the show. TV is not as strong on a singular protagonist as features are. But a lot of shows, regardless, are still going to have one or two people at the heart of most of the conflict, right? Even shows that have a big cast are going to very often, except in the rare examples of true ensembles, which would be something like This Is Us, um, or um, there's certain other formats of particularly like Korean dramas, for instance, sometimes have a really big cast with honestly equally weighted no central one character, right? Those are very, 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 very difficult to pull off. So I would not lean on that. Oh, I guess I'm just writing an ensemble show just because you aren't clear on who your protagonist is. More likely than not, you just have not sharply enough defined who your protagonist is. It is most likely not an ensemble show. Um, but regardless of that, let's look at The Office. Michael is our kind of flawed protagonist for the show. In some cases, he acts a little bit sort of, quote, villainously in that he acts very selfishly a lot of the time, but his actions and reactions are most often causing the heart of the conflict in each episode. He has a persistent goal as well, which is useful for a story engine, that it's even if it's just like saying the character is always doing different stuff, but all of it is basically in service of what? Making money, having a successful business, you know, finding love, something like that, right? Having one kind of clearer goal, even if it is a little bit more abstracted, or even if it's not very tangible or concrete and would take many years to ultimately get through, like the the story engine should still make very apparent, or it should still be very apparent in your show to have a clear story engine, what your character is just repeatedly trying to do, right? If every episode is just sort of like, well, they just, I don't know, do stuff, then it's tricky to make a story engine like that very apparent. You will then have to lean very heavily on the characters and their dynamics in that case. Um, so having a persistent goal, if that is something that your characters are trying to do, like in The Office, they're always trying to make The Office run smoothly and get more clients and um, keep the business running and expanding, basically. But, dot, 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 the but is always a good important part of the story engine, right? But his incompetence, awkwardness, and desperate need for approval cause problems that need to be solved. So for instance, an episode of the an average episode of the office is going to be something like uh, the office um, Michael makes too many weird that's what she said jokes and as a result the office calls a harassment training seminar, right? That now the characters have to sort of suffer through this really awkward and embarrassing seminar where they learn how to talk to coworkers. And um, ultimately, that is kicked off by Michael's decision or Michael's choices and actions to be weird and creepy and awkward, right? So you can look at these character traits as really essential parts of the story engine. His incompetence, awkwardness, and desperate need for approval are going to be at the heart of a lot of the problems that come up in the show. The main character is really important in illustrating the story engine. Next, we have um, Jim and Pam. They are sort of uh, the uh, more, they are the more relatable characters. The, their sort of slow-moving office romance takes center stage in a lot of the show's big arcs, and in terms of a sense of progress, sitcoms most of the time will use the development of relationships as their primary indicator of that progress, or the primary markers of that progress will be advancement in the steps of those relationships. Um, I think it's just very easy to have plot lines that resolve on a one per episode basis but then we're watching for the characters like think of think of your your big sitcoms most of the time people are really really getting invested in and rooting for the relationships between the characters so that is going to be one of the main draws and one main aspects one of the main gears in the story engine right so jim and pam's romance um episodes sort of alternate between michael and jim playing the lead in the kind of a story of the episode with exceptions throughout in later seasons but for the most part it's either going to be jim or michael as the kind of main character of the episode right most of the time it's michael sometimes it can be portrayed as jim in any case jim and pam are a really key aspect of the story engine too because they work for michael they are his employees so they are forced to interact with him and are forced again and again to come up against his flaws which are causing these problems, right? The incompetence, the awkwardness, the need for approval. So just within this setup, we can see how they're trapped in the situation together. They can, one of, if, if it feels like the characters could or should just leave, then the story engine starts to suffer or st uh, um, sputter a little bit, right? 
it might be like if your characters move into a haunted house and it's a whole show about living in a haunted house you're going to have to have a really good reason why your characters can't just leave the haunted house or else we're going to say oh, well why is this going to last beyond the pilot so the pilot needs to make it clear how this is a show um, and then last we have Dwight who's the antagonist sort of role a lot of the time He's the lackey to Michael, so also has a connection and specific relationship to Michael, where he's trying to impress him and get more favor from him, as opposed to Jim, whom he's very competitive with. He's always competing with Jim and engaging in prank wars with Jim and things like this in an effort to get ahead, to be the favorite, to be the teacher's pet, and ultimately, because we get the feeling he wants to rise through the ranks and eventually be in charge at the company as well. So there's our four main characters of The Office, and just within these dynamics, you can think of any number of pairings of these characters. We could do a Michael and Pam episode, a Jim and Dwight episode. You could do a Michael and Dwight episode, a Jim and Pam episode. Uh, you can, you know, find the little diagram that you could combine all these characters in different ways and get lots of unique combinations. And within that, we can always imagine the characters have a persistent goal, which is keep the business running smoothly and resolve conflicts at that business. We have a, an aspect or element that is causing problems or conflict between them, which is Michael's unfortunate personality traits as, as, as the main heart of it. Sometimes also other antagonistic characters like Dwight are going to fuel that conflict with their very quirky, unique, annoying personalities as well. And then our sort of um, everyman hero, Jim, is going to be the one that the audience is usually going to be following around and, and most invested in. And also, um, is, it's going to fall upon him to solve the problems at the office. Very rarely is Dwight going to be the one to sort of save the day, right? So this is going to be like Jim and Pam putting out fires caused by Michael. That's kind of the show. And I know there's many other aspects to it, too. There's plenty of other characters. There's, a, there's at least a dozen other main characters in the show with lots of side characters, too. Lots of different types of plots and, and conflicts that come up on an episode-by-episode -episode basis. But at the heart of it, at the very core of what makes the show tick is Michael's the boss. He does weird, unawkward, and uncomfortable things that cause problems that need to be solved, largely by Jim and Pam. That's the show. So I hope that's clear. That's how story engines kind of work, right? It's not just one thing. It's a combination of different things that ultimately go on to feel like they could support many years of narrative using this same setup. If it feels like your show's going to be changing premises every episode, then the story engine might not feel very clear at all. It might be incredibly murky. And if the story feels like it could easily resolve within two hours, then the story engine's going to be absolutely invisible as well. Ravenstar says, good idea to focus on the heart of the show for the pilot with the story engine. Yeah, exactly. So the pilot should make it very clear how the rest of the show is going to work. The pilot is like an advertisement for the rest of the show. It's what you have to get everyone to invest in and to buy into if they want to make the rest of the show. So it's what people are going to use to judge if they want to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, potentially, of their company's money on making the rest of the thing. So the pilot has to be really, really exemplary, standout example of amazing writing. And on top of that, it feels like it's the first sample of what ultimately would be an engaging, successful show with a strong story engine powering it. I want to stop and take any questions on story engines before we proceed. Everybody feel like they have a good sense of what this means and how to kind of think of or balance these things. Any ideas, thoughts, or questions on story engines? Looks like we have a few folks typing, so I'll let you guys finish your questions there. Hopefully everyone else is still working on your log lines in your other tab, filling out the answers to those questions and those things that we put at the top of your sketchbook, like title, genre, comps, format. Here's a question from Michael. What about a show like Breaking Bad, where the story engine is starting to fall into place as opposed to The Office, where everyone's already hired? Uh, so a show like Breaking Bad, the story engine clicks into place by the middle of the pilot. So Walt and Jesse have teamed up to make meth together, and then they're actually doing that in the pilot. A lot of people who are breaking into TV writing when they're first getting started, I'll say amateur scripts or whatever, not in a judgmental way, but a lot of amateur scripts will be, for instance, they'd be like, no, Walt and Jesse will meet halfway through season one. Episode one is all just about Walt teaching at high school. And then in episode three, maybe conceivably he would find out he has cancer. Then episode four five he hears about jesse then episode eight he meets jesse when that's really not the best way to do it you need to make the first episode a clear representative sample of what the show will be so have if there's a sort of central team up or central aspects or things that people that need to meet 
or things that need to kick into gear by in order to illustrate what the show is at its core, that needs to happen by halfway through the pilot in most cases. Um, if everyone's already sort of hired and we're just being dropped into the middle of a world that is we're facing a different f situation of the week every time, then oh, it's kind of like movie rules apply, right? We have the normal worlds, so we have the sort of before the inciting incident with the first act until the catalyst happens, which is going to shake up that status quo. It might upset the uh, you know the normal world and threaten to change it, and your characters are trying to get things back to normal. Or it might be an opportunity for things to change that your characters try. Like, think of an episode of Gilligan's Island, right? It's going to be like, hey, we saw a ship in the distance. That's the catalyst. And now the episode is going to be about we have to make a big smoke signal to signal the ship, right? So the catalyst is usually going to be something that threatens to change the status quo in a good or bad way for your hero. And they're going to be either attempting to fix things and return them to normal, or they're going to be attempting to change their life in the way that that opportunity provides for them. Luke asks, what's the most important part of the story engine to include in the logline? So um, of all the different parts of the story engines, the characters are really at the heart of this. So pick um, an adjective, a, a careful, clear adjective to describe your main character. And then you might want to mention another character too in the logline. If you're just mentioning one single character and it doesn't become clear how anyone else is involved in the story, then something might be a little off in terms of story engine. Think of if your show is about, I don't know, a hitman, right? And you're like, a hitman does various jobs. And that's the series logline for your show. It doesn't really feel like a strong story engine because your character is not connected to anyone. There's no one to contrast them to. If it's more like a hitman tries to live a normal life in the upscale suburbs of Detroit, now I start to see the story engine because I see different aspects of his life. Or something that he has to balance that side of his life with, right? The relationships with these other characters are going to hinder and hamper his ability to be a hitman, and the fact that he's a hitman is going to hinder and hamper his uh, ability to be a family man, right? So the most important aspect of the story engine to highlight in the logline is going to be the dynamic between the characters. Um, and if that, if your character, if your show focuses really strongly on just one person, then focus, then bring to the surface more than anything else how your character's own traits are going to sort of be their own worst enemy, right? Someone like Don Draper, or someone like that, for instance, you might want to clarify how his, you know, these three personality traits are always the thing that are causing trouble and are creating the conflicts in the episodes. But chances are, you have to mention at least one other person. Any other questions on story engines? Luke says he's going to try a radical rewrite of his logline. Okay, great. Uh, I have a question in chat. How do I feel about alternate structures? I'm not sure exactly what that means. Like, for act. Uh, so every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So a first, a second, and a third act. Um, in hour-long TV, they actually are written out as five acts. So we have five act breaks, right, in a traditional hour-long show. Um, but that doesn't stop, that doesn't change the fact that the story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. So really, five acts is actually three acts. Three acts is really three acts. One act is really three acts. So I think that ultimately there kind of can't be uh, a different uh, paradigm than beginning, middle, and end, right? So no matter what you're using, I think that aspect is always going to be there. The, the three-act structure is very baked into the idea of how we understand stories in general. Seven-act I've never heard of, so you've lost me there. <laughs> Ravenstar says, are the loglines we're focusing on meant to be the same project we shared last week? They can be, yeah, if you want. Um, if you feel that you've revised your logline from last week and you don't need any more feedback, you don't need to share it today. But if you still have questions about it or you've modified it and you aren't sure about it, then you can get extra feedback on it today, yes. Aniket says, I don't have an idea for a show yet. Can I come up with a logline before the next session? Yeah, sure. You don't. Ha you never actually have to share. Um, any week, you can share whatever you feel you need feedback on. If you just want to listen in or, or anything else, that's always also totally fine. So if you don't have an idea for a show yet, brainstorm today. Think of new ideas and spend this whole week filling out various sketchbooks. Or maybe have one sketchbook where you try to just write down different ideas. Try to have a finished logline by, by next class if you can. But next class, we will check in one more time on loglines and try to... That will be our last logline day. will be next Sunday. 
so yes, take your time if you need to think of a show. You don't have. To, it's better to take a little time rather than share something totally unfinished. All right. Um, so if um, everyone's clear on story engines, hopefully you're seeing how the engine of your concept can generate conflict for many different episodes. We're going to get a little bit into. I want to touch on time slot and format, then I'll get into genres and log lines. Excuse me. <clears throat> So um, let's look at time slot and format. I'll be pretty quick on this just because I went into this a lot more in depth last week. Your options are half hour or full hour. You're, if you're writing half hour, it's like 30 to 35 pages. If you're writing 60 minute, it's 60 to 65 pages. Um, these are half hour usually going to be comedy shows and very episodic, you know, very sort of serialized thing of the week type shows. But there's enough exceptions nowadays that that's not necessarily true. You can write drama, horror, anything else at half hour if you want to. Hour-long shows you can write in any genre, except the one real exception. The thing that doesn't exist in Western media is hour-long comedy. So that would be the one thing I would say Don't actually don't pick that genre because it doesn't exist is hour-long sitcom, for instance. We just don't have that. And most people probably wouldn't read it because they'd be like, this person, even by writing this, has proved that they don't understand TV writing to some extent. So don't write an hour-long sitcom. Um, but beyond that, you can write hour-long whatever you want. If you We have hour-long superhero cartoons now, so you could do that. Um, li literally, the, the doors are wide open to anything at all except for hour-long comedy. And then we have, there are other formats of shows, 15-minute or 70-minute miniseries or limited series or web shows or things like that. Um, they exist, but I'm not going to be focusing on those in these classes. For the most part, pilots for a standard TV writing portfolio are 60-minute or 30-minute. Let's look at premise versus status quo. So a premise, these are the, these are called continuity formats. Continuity means how does the story carry over from episode to episode? How does it continue from one episode to the, to the next, right? A premise pilot is like a long movie in what would be uh, a, or I guess I should say it's like the first chapter in a long movie, right? So this is a very long story that will take potentially years and years to get through the entire thing, but we need to follow it linearly and watch every episode to understand what's happening in the next one. A show like Mr. Robot or whatever, right? We have to actually watch every episode. You can't just drop in at any point and know what's going on or who the characters are. So the characters are going to change over the course of many seasons. Um, and in any case, these are going to be shows that the character is changing gradually over time. Change in TV is more gradual than change in movies. Your, your character doesn't have to be a drastically different person by the end of the pilot. TV is more about we slowly change the protagonist on an episode-by-episode -episode basis so that maybe a season or two down the line there's somebody else, right? But it takes longer for characters to change on TV simply because we can explore the day-to-day -day moments of their lives and they, like their lives simply take up more space on the screen than movie characters who really only exist in very brief flashes, right? Just two hours, then they're gone forever. Um, status quo is the other continuity format. This is one that resets the continuity every episode. Something like most cartoons are going to be uh, the status quo. Um, sitcoms, procedurals like Law and Order or cop procedurals, medical procedurals, things like this. These are mostly going to be shows you can tune in at any time and watch them in any order. You won't miss anything. So you have to make it very clear if you're doing one type of show or the other one because the main difference is that a premise pilot is going to have lots of questions unanswered, lots of conflicts unresolved, and lots of maybe antagonists undefeated or things like that, right? We have to leave track for the story to go down. And in the last few pages, especially in like The Stinger, for instance, you want to kind of suggest this is where it's going. This is what antagonists we're going to have to deal with again next week. Or maybe, you know, we beat one monster, but we awoken the hive of a thousand other monsters or, or whatever it is. So you have to leave some threads kind of untied off and some questions unanswered in a premise pilot. You can't solve every single problem by the end of a premise pilot or else it will feel like this isn't a premise pilot. This is a status quo show. Whereas a status quo show, it should actually wrap up every thread by the end, with rare exceptions. Um, generally, you should be wrapping up all the threads, and you should be um, resolving the main conflict in such a way that we sort of understand that the pieces are going to be there to pick up for next week. If you blow up the world at the end of the status quo show, we might kind of be left in uh, kind of questioning how there could be more of this same status quo, right? Unless you're setting up the idea that the entire world resets, like a Courage the Cowardly Dog episode or something like that where literally a character could die at the end of an episode and we come back next week and everything is fine again. You might build out that expectation, but that typically only that usually only works in cartoons. Um, I don't think there's any live-action examples of that, at least on right now. Anyway, 
Hopefully this makes sense, these two major continuity formats, premise versus status quo. And you should be labeling and making that choice for your show and plotting accordingly and deciding what am I going to answer, what, what conflicts are going to be fully tied off and resolved by the end, and what will still be going, right? And if you're doing the problem of the week, which usually thing of the week is how we describe the status quo type show, then we need to resolve the thing of the week entirely by the end and leave your characters in a position where they're ready to take on the next thing of the week. Whether that's a domestic problem of the week, or maybe it's a, um, you know emergency rescue of the week or something like that, we conclude that, however, whether it ends well or whether it ends badly, and we say, next week there will be another one kind of like this. Eden mentions Supernatural. Nobody ever permadies in the show besides Charlie. Yeah, okay, some some shows in the sort of more comic book kind of tradition or certain, like, fantasy-type genres where the characters don't ever really... Testing? Sorry, my mic came unplugged. Am I back? I think I'm back. Okay, looks like I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, Alright. Uh, where are we? So, um... I hope everyone's super clear on premise versus status quo and on their time slot. So we're talking time slot and continuity format. So you should be able to say this is a 30 minute status quo or this is a hour long premise show, etc. The last thing that we'll touch on is genres. So these are basically your options when it comes to genre. I wouldn't make up your own genres and I wouldn't try to combine more than two different things because it will just then be very unclear what you're going for or how to give feedback to it. So comedy, drama, crime, sci-fi, fantasy, action, adventure, mystery, thriller, and horror. Basically your options, um, and you can see some of those have slashes between them indicating that some people sort of just lump those together. So they may not even be fully distinct TV genres on their own. Mystery thriller is pretty much the same genre on TV, for instance. Horror is sort of a newer TV genre as of, I don't know, the Walking Dead kind of era, I guess is what ushered in this idea of horror as a TV show. It was really rare to see in the past, so that is a distinct genre now, in any case. And you can combine two of these. So you could say this is going to be a crime sci-fi show if you're doing like a minority report kind of thing, right? Or maybe we're doing a horror comedy show like Ash vs. the Evil Dead or something like that. But you can see how we can always just boil it down to two. Don't include a big list of genres uh, if you want the audience to know what they're getting into, right? If you say it's nine different flavors, then nobody knows if they should show up for that meal. So pick two genres at the most. And now let's get into logline. So series logline, we touched on pilot logline, so I'll just go back to that template. When or after inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before stakes. Those are the basic things we want to know. What starts off the story? Who is the main character? What are they up against? And what happens if they don't? You know, where is the urgency coming from? Um, so let's look at series logline, which is in opposition to the pilot logline a little bit farther back, right? We're looking at the entire show and we're conveying the sort of idea of the story engine, which is the central conflicts and dynamics of the show that will sustain many episodes of, the, of a theoretical series that you probably will not get. So do not write further episodes beyond the pilot ever. Don't ever do it. Unique characters, story worlds, or situations that promise many episodes are kind of where the emphasis is in terms of the series logline. And a series logline is a little different than a movie because a sometimes a TV show builds on the initial concept over time, premise shows especially. And so because of that, the emphasis is on the compelling characters and the intriguing worlds that they exist in. So instead of looking more at the rules and guidelines, let's just look up some, some examples here. So like here's an example of a kind of abstract series logline, right? How, this isn't telling me one concrete tangible goal the characters need to accomplish. It's more describing the type of conflict that every episode is going to revolve around. A black family man struggles to gain a sense of cultural identity while raising his kids in a predominantly white upper middle class neighborhood. That's called Blackish Status Quo Comedy, 30 Minute, that ran for many years and just ended a couple years ago. So, struggling to gain a sense of cultural identity is the type of conflict that every other episode of the show will revolve around. It doesn't say specifically he has to make 100 pies in order to be accepted in this neighborhood or something like that, right? We don't have the really clear goalpost on the uh, logline. Whereas in a pilot logline, you'd want to say something like, you know, when he shows up in this neighborhood, he has one week to make 100 pies in order to be accepted by his neighbors or something like that, right? 
So that's a dumb example. <laughs> but you see how the really tangible number, the end date, the ticking clock, those things are really useful in terms of pilot log lines. Series log line is a little bit broader. If you do have a ticking clock for the whole series, you can include it. Like this is a crime drama or crime thriller premise, right? A fast talking financial advisor drags his family from Chicago to the Missouri Ozarks, where he must launder $500 million in five years to appease a drug boss. That's my favorite series log line of all time because it includes absolutely everything, right? We have adjective protagonist, who is the rest of the cast, so who is the kind of team up or the, the, the dynamics between these people. We might imagine that because he has to drag his family that they are not actually actively interested or involved in the crime shenanigans um, and that he's going to have to balance these two separate lives of crime life and family life, right? And he ha we, have we even know who the villain is. It's a drug boss that he has five years to appease so we know what the timeline is. We know specifically what the goalpost is. So this one has that really clear sense of time and goalpost and this could almost be a movie logline just on a longer scale, right? Um, you don't absolutely need to clarify that if you don't have a clear finish line like Breaking Bad doesn't really have that clear goal or finish line from the beginning besides he's trying to make money for his family and get as far as he can, right? A high school chemistry teacher diagnosed with inoperable lung cancer turns to manufacturing and selling meth to secure his family's future. Notice again we do mention the other characters of the other dynamics of the protagonist's life. He's making money and also or he's making drugs and also has a family that he cares about and is trying to help and support, but by doing increasingly dangerous, illegal things. So in that one, we don't really have that end goal built into it. It's not like he has to make $100 million by January 8th in order to secure his family's future or whatever. But at the end of the day, we understand the interesting character, the interesting world or dynamic of social world that they live in, and how that's going to end up creating conflict for years and supporting years of dramatic narrative. Uh, let's look at questions in the chat. Um, Ginger says, which logline is the one that's used when you're looking at a show on Netflix, for example? So th that's different. Um, the inter When we're talking loglines, these are things that are mostly used internally by us, the writers. Like when you, It's not easy to just look up a movie or show and find, quote, the official logline. They don't really have official loglines. Like when the writer first pitched that show, they might have had something that has that changed over time. And then maybe in the marketing for that show on the streaming site, they rewrote it again. Like we can't really assess what the official singular log lines are for professional work unless you talk to that writer and maybe they have the very first version of it that they used. So what you're looking at in terms of Netflix are going to be more similar to the series log lines because they're going to tell you what the show is in general, right? It's going to be like, what is it? A... A uh, smart and sassy monster hunter lives in downtown Toronto and must battle vampires, or something like that, right? Like, that's pretty much a series logline. And then, when you look at the episode descriptions, that's going to be a little closer to what we're doing for the pilot logline, which is like, when she moves to the suburbs of Toronto, a sassy demon hunter must first fight a mummy. That's going to be, like, the very first of those conflicts that we are going to illustrate and see played out in the show. The biggest, and, and this came up a lot last week, um, I would recommend everyone really carefully look at this. The biggest problem with these series and pilot log lines um, from students in these courses and just from people who are breaking into this in general is that they feel like separate shows. So they shouldn't feel like completely different shows. Like if you mention, for instance, the series log line is like the smart and sassy monster hunter moves to Toronto and now fights vampires. And then in the pilot log line, you're like, Jeff, a werewolf, needs to earn his very first um, tooth necklace as part of his tribe's initiation ceremony. And we'll be like, wait, what about the Monster Hunter? What about Toronto? That sounds like a different show. So ultimately, make sure your series and pilot log lines feel like they're the same show and referring to the same characters that you just mentioned. Don't introduce a new cast of characters with both separate log lines. Um, okay, hopefully that helps. Thank you for the question, Ginger. So I'm going to um, move forward a little bit. I want to answer give a couple last tips and answer any last questions on long lines then we will share and post for feedback so don't post them yet i'll let you know in just these next couple minutes let me take any questions on log lines or anything we've talked about today in relation to pilot writing i'll just leave these tips up as i'm answering the questions go ahead And in the meantime, I see a few folks are typing. As we're doing this, be getting your logline ready to copy and paste. Because in the next five minutes, we will share them. And I will be taking them in the order that they come in. 
So any questions that I can tackle before we share? Feel free to raise a hand or use the text chat either way. Okay, no questions. Sounds good, let's share log lines then. Feel free to post what you've got. And as you guys are posting, I'm gonna briefly touch on comps. You don't have to have comps as you share your log lines, but you can. So as you are posting, I'll just briefly talk over what comps are. So comps, we usually include in the ultimate, like this should go at the top of your sketchbook page. Um, and you can have a couple of different ideas if you're not sure which ones to settle on. But we really are comparing your show to two other works of fiction. At least one of them should be a TV show. So don't list two books or two movies or two video games or whatever. But nowadays, one of them can be one of those other things if you really want to. Uh, you, yeah, you can comp a play or a video game if you want. You can comp Hamilton or Gears of War in your TV show comp. As long as, yeah, someone do Hamilton meets Gears of War. But <laughs> one of them does have to be a TV show, though. So, you know, Hamilton meets The Office or Gears of War meets, uh, you know, Lost. And now we're cooking. Now that feels a little bit more like a show. So definitely don't do two things that are not shows. You might think of it in these terms, the world of X, but with the style, tone, or approach of Y. That's not an exact science, and that's not always, always, always going to work. Um, and uh, so try your best. Just if if this is part of what you have so far, you can share the comps because it is helpful in picturing the overall vision of the show. They tend to skew towards things that are a little bit more recent, so don't pick things that are going to be obscure or that no one will know. You don't earn points for someone not knowing what your comps are. Um, and don't pick trendy things that are way over comped. If you're picking Harry, uh, if you're writing a fantasy show, don't comp Lord of the Rings meets Harry Potter because we'll just be like, come on. Okay, so try to narrow it down to two. Try to make it clear what you're going for in your show, and don't mislead the audience. So if you have a lot of, if your show is purely historical, don't comp something with supernatural elements, or else we're going to start thinking you comp Pirates of the Caribbean and Lord of the Rings. So we expect magic in your show too. So don't lead us down the wrong path with your comps. Would be my only tip. Okay, um, let's look at the log lines we have to share today. Uh, okay, looks like we have Eden, Vicky, Sinzanal, Luke, Charlie, Michael, Raven. All right, a bunch to get to, uh, and not a ton of time, so we're going to get to as many as I can. Um, you will need to unmute and answer questions and discuss your idea. If you're not able to do that, I will have to skip you for now. Um, so be ready to unmute as we go from person to person. Okay, um, and if we gave you, if I gave you feedback last week or multiple times in the past before, I might take a little less time on it than on somebody that's thing is brand new. All right, let's start with uh, Eden for Eke Homo. Hello, I still don't know how to pronounce that, so good enough. Um, I have revised the pilot logline thoroughly, and the series logline is the, uh, eh, I okay. think I'm getting there. All right. Um, Go ahead. And for comps, I, I genuinely cannot find anything that would be even remotely similar, besides, like I mentioned last time, Zootopia, but that is remote, like second cousin quite removed from the brother's mother's horse. Okay, so it's usually a red flag for an idea if you can't think of a single comp that is anything remotely like it, so I would, you don't have to have the answers now, but just over the coming weeks, maybe ask around, maybe some folks will have, like especially maybe in the sci-fi chat or something like that, people might have some ideas for you. Um, I would just try to have, oh. even if they're not perfect, try to have some some kind of comps uh, attached to the idea. Why? Is Why? originality a bad thing? No, it's less about originality, and it's more, uh, it's about us being able to assess what your goals are in, or intentions are for the show, what the tone is going to be like, uh, or any number of other aspects like that. So it's for us to be able to tell what you're trying to make. the tone... You get the tone from the uh, from the genre, and you get the goals from from the log lines or from asking questions. So, I don't see the problem. 
not everyone's going to ask you questions about your script. A lot of the time you can put in a couple of things like the logline title genre comps, and that's all you have to get somebody to read it. If you don't include comps at all, less people will read the episode. That's just how it works. All right, so can you read out your series logline for us? Okay, uh, my series logline is in a world where genetic engineering breeds a subjugated class, a resilient gaggle of biogenetically engineered cat boys must navigate abandonment and abuse, forging deep bonds as they challenge societal norms, offering a poignant social commentary on the nature of humanity and self. I, like I said, that's a work in progress. Okay. And my, uh, you just said series logline, right? Yeah, that was that. You can read the pilot next if you want yeah. to. The the one thing I'll say on this is so don't talk about the themes or the social impact of the show. That's up to the audience gotcha. to to assess. So the basics in a world where genetically en genetic engineering breeds a sub subjugated class. I get that. Okay, a resilient gaggle of biogenetically engineered. So let's try to avoid repeating words too many times. You say genetic engineering twice, or maybe even three times in the in this logline. So if you can just think of a slightly different way to phrase it, for, just to avoid feeling repetitive. They must navigate ab abandonment and abuse, forging deep bonds as they challenge social norms. Uh, okay, I'm not 100% under understanding what the characters are exactly trying to do besides just kind of live their lives. Is there more to it? Do they have a, more of a goal than that? Uh, well, well, like I said before, they're a slave race, so uh, there there is a, a kind of uh, trying to emancipate themselves, but n not like actively. How do you emancipate yourself passively? Are are they working towards freedom, or aren't they? I guess is the question. They aren't. They, they aren't. They think it's the status quo. But the people around them uh, think differently, and uh, the conflict arises when they are uh, 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 deprogrammed, so to speak. I don't like that, to use that word because people have uh, mistook my characters for robots, which they are not. That's why I specifically use biogenetically engineered to, to make abundantly and crystal clear that they are, in fact, biological beings. Okay, let's move on to the pilot logline, but just in terms of the series logline, I still cannot picture what your characters are doing in terms of a goal. If you say they are working towards freedom yeah, eventually... Yeah, like that, that, that wouldn't need work. That, that's okay. So but my pilot logline, I think, I, think I, I, I finally got it to a point where I like it. Okay. Okay, so pilot logline. When a reclusive ex-cage fighter meets an abused teen, forming an unlikely bond, they both become mentors to a fish out of water gentle giant on trial for assault to acclimate to the hell oh boy too many twos to acclimate him to the vast world he is experiencing for the first time so he can integrate into society whoa okay so too many ideas to this is a bit of a run-on sentence um let's look at the basics so a reclusive ex-cage fighter forms an unlikely bond with an abused teen. They both become mentors to a fish-out-of-water gentle giant on trial for assault. To acclimate? To, wait, what? They become mentors? Acclimate. Right, I, I, know the, I know the word, but are you saying they both become mentors to this giant in the, with the intention of helping him acclimate to the world? Is that right? Yeah. I think there's some words missing here. In order to probably acclimate, uh, there should be. Okay, so like in order to help him acclimate to the vast world he is experiencing for the first time so he can integrate to society. So way too much information, and it's just a very long sentence with too many, in order to do this, to do this, to do this, to do this, to do this. So I would try to cut back and just simplify a little bit. And also, why do they have to do this? I, I missed the cause and effect. What's the cause and effect here? Well, if they don't, if they don't acclimate him, he's he's not going to be a part of the society. Isn't that like the goal? I don't know. What's their relationship to this guy? You're, you're saying they become mentors to him. Is he a family friend? Is what is their relationship to this giant guy? 
that's what you have to find out that that's why you want to watch that no no so the you're not trying to tease people in with the log lines you have to lay out what is happening in the episode the tease should be this is an interesting dramatic situation that you're now going to be invest you're going to watch because you have the key info you're not going to watch it to get the key info So there might be a way there that you can just clarify what is the connection between these people. You say they must do this. Okay. If, if they must do it, then it should be clear why they must, right? Is there another word for pound that doesn't sound so much animals and KP? Did you say pound? Like a pound for, for, yeah. dogs, and, for dogs and cats? Yeah. Um, yes, like a... I because because the main setting of my uh, uh, of, of my pilot is basically what I I just quote unquote call a pound because it is where these people are sheltered. That, that's a good word. Yeah. So basically, the three of them end up in the same shelter because they're part part of the genetically engineered race of non people. Mm -hmm. And uh, that 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 is the whole point. They want to integrate this third one into society because because their goal is to either get adopted or get a job. Okay. So wait. they don't, you know, so they don't uh, become like a burden on society, and prove themselves to to people for being somehow useful. I guess. Okay, so all of the characters are in like prison together, basically. They're not in prison. They they can go in and out. It's 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 not a prison. That's that's why I don't want to use the word pound. It's more it's more like more like like a homeless shelter. But 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 they're not homeless. They have rooms there. I okay. mean, there's probably a word, but I don't know. Okay. Well, you can do some more thinking on what the specific word for the type of institution it is but just in terms of cause and uh effect so it seems like you are stacking up several different incidents one you have the cage fighter meeting and bonding with this teen and then another incident of they become mentors to this other character that is on trial for assault um so i think that's uh if i in in terms of cause and effect usually the first thing leads to the next thing right so the first thing that we say le causes the next thing that you mentioned to happen. But is these two meeting and bonding, is that what causes them to then become mentors to this guy? This is why I asked you about, about the different act uh, number structures, because uh, I, I am working with a seven act structure in, in this specific instance, actually. Okay. And it is it is separated into two parts, so so it is one pilot, but it can technically function as two episodes if 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 you squint and tilt your head. And the first one is the cage fighter and the team meeting and bonding, and the second part is them two being already met and bonded, meeting this third guy who they take under their collective wing, basically. Oh, so you're saying and, this is two uh, separate stories. And the team becomes the mentor to third one. So you're saying these are two separate stories? No, they're connected. They're very much connected. One cannot function with, without the other. Uh, okay, so I think you just need the sense of cause and effect in the logline itself, though. So when, and for, uh -huh. for instance, you might start with, you say he's on trial for assault. Why not start with that? When a blank character um is in trouble for assault for whatever then you would say this character must exonerate him or must do blank and you know get him uh, help him break out of jail whatever it is that your character's goal actually is so maybe you could start with the assault or the problem that the giant caused hmm a because that's the cause right yeah but well, that's the cause why he ended up in the shelter pound. Okay. SU place. That's why he needs help acclimating to the world, right? 
Well, he he was on trial for that, but he was pardoned, and that's like a big thing in the world because it's the first instance where where one of their kind was not put to death for something like that. He was pardoned and released into this facility, and he's like the only one who who is technically not uh, allowed to leave it because because he's still like under strict supervision. In, but in the logline, you say because he's on trial. Because everybody thinks he's dangerous. In the logline, doesn't it say he's on trial for assault? Uh, how do how do you say when he's off the trial, like past the trial, like? Mm. Uh, he was exonerated for assault, or acquitted. Acquitted. I think acquitted makes sense. Okay. So yeah. Or pardoned. He... Pardoned. It specifically, it, I specifically used the word pardon in, in my script, and I didn't... Yeah, pardon. Okay, so that's a totally different conflict than a character that is actively on trial, I guess. So I would just maybe look into rephrasing that. I mean, it, the first yeah. half, he's still on trial, and the, the, it culminates with, with the two main characters finding out that he has been pardoned. So they don't have to interact with the trial at all? They interact with the trial because it concerns them, because it's part of their people being tried for something that they perceive as a, as self-defense. Right, but if they're not participating in it, then it's not actually part of the main plot of the episode, it sounds like. It's not really like the conflict that these characters are trying to resolve, is it? The conflict they're trying to resolve is integrating him in, into society because, because he's never seen spoons and forks, basically. Okay, so I think you should start with the problem and then tell us what the characters are doing to solve it. So don't start with the character, then tell us the problem, then tell us what the, what someone else is doing to solve it. So start with something like when he's acquitted for, tr or, or maybe when he, uh, when a gentle giant struggles to reintegrate into society, a reclusive ex cage fighter and his, I don't know, friend, whatever it is, must help him acclimate before or else blank. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so cause and effect, start with the problem. Main character, dot dot dot, must solve it like this, before slash or else this. That's the stakes. Uh, can you throw this into my DMs for me, please? Uh, sure. All of it, including the corrected logline. Yeah, no problem. I didn't mark it up too much, but I'll, I'll send this to you, sure. No problem. Thank you. All right, thanks for sharing. Hope that was helpful. Um, let's move on to our next one. Who, uh, let me scroll up here. Wait, where did she go? There it is, okay. I will send this to you. And then we will move down the list. Sorry, scrolling back up. Looks like we have Vicky. All right, Vicky, you're invited to the stage. Let's talk beyond the signals. Go ahead. Yes. I think the series logline is okay. I added like one or two things to it only. Okay. The one that I had trouble with was the pilot log line. But I suppose we have to read both to like have the context. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, just read the whole thing. Okay. So the series log line would be when their best friend disappears in a series of mysterious disappearances that devastate a bay town in the south of Chile. A pair of twin witches join forces with an American investigator to discover what's behind them before the entire town vanishes. Nice, very nice. When their best it's the only thing is when their best friend disappears in a series of mysterious disappearances just sounds kind of repetitive is the only thing. So, um when their when their best friend is the most recent victim in a series of disappearances, something like that. Do you see you just just change the first couple words of that sentence there just to make it not repeat itself. They devastate a bay town in the south of Chile. Okay, a pair, of, a pair of twin witches join forces with an American investigator 
to discover what's behind them before the entire town vanishes. Great. All right. The rest of it looks really good. Let's do the pilot. Okay. A misanthropic witch uses her, bound, her body powers of clairvoyance to search for her missing best friend while evading a relentless CIA agent investigating the paranormal events. Nice. So is this the guy they're going to they're going to like team up with him by the end of the episode? Is that right? In this episode, they're not going to team up with him, but I'm going to present him like he they're eventually going to have to team up with. You mean like later episodes down the line? Yes, but I'm going to present him like part of the investigation. So this is kind of what I was talking about earlier about like different shows in the series and pilot logline. It sounds like the 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 pair of witches joining forces with the American investigator doesn't. If that doesn't happen in the pilot, you should rethink the series logline itself, um, or make them team up in the pilot. That would probably be my recommendation: is team up at least by the fifty, sixty percent of the way through the episode. Maybe that's the midpoint. Maybe that's the escalation or something like that. Or at least have them start to, you know, drift towards working on the same side by the end. Have them sort of working together by the end. That would be my recommendation. If you don't do that, you may have to change the series logline. Because it's presenting the idea that the pilot is the first chapter in this overall series, right? So if you, And the pilot is supposed to act as like a trailer for the series. And so if you're saying that a big part of the hook of the show is this central team-up, then the central team-up has to happen in the pilot. Otherwise, you wouldn't lead with that. Okay, so maybe I have to change the ending because, like, they don't team up really. He's like there, and he's like making a bit more trouble than what he's helping in the beginning. Okay, yeah, then I wouldn't say they're really joining for if they're not joining forces with him in the pilot. Then in that case, they're, it sounds like they're kind of competing with him. Is that right? In a way, yes. So maybe looking to some word like that, maybe compete's not the exact right thing, but a pair of witches compete with an American investigator. They're both trying to discover what's behind them before the town vanishes. Does that sound like it could kind of describe your show? Uh, yeah, that sounds a bit more like it. Okay, yeah, they don't have to work together. If, that, if they're going to have an antagonistic relationship all throughout, then you're going to want to hint at that early on. So that would be some, something like that is how I would probably present it. And then, yeah, the fact that you've, you're framing it as she needs to evade him, that's great. It's just that you haven't... Who's Isn't there a twin character in the pilot? Or no? She is, but she's not as relevant as her sister in this one. Okay, I understand. In that case... Yeah, during ahead. the series, they're going to have like different like dynamics of who takes the episode and who doesn't. I see. Like, they're... They both are going to have different, like, set of stories at a certain point. Okay, understood. Um, does the feedback I've given so far make sense of how you might want to either rethink the team-up idea or change the series logline just to make it seem a little more competitive between the cops and the witches? Yes, I, I think that compete is better in this case. Okay, great. Well, hope that's helpful then. I think by now you've refined this enough that I get the setup and looking forward to seeing more. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do sins and all with thank you for being here with us. Hello. 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 Hi, I can hear you. Thanks okay, for yes. Us. I'm it's confused. No problem. Why don't you read out what you have for us today? Okay, so I have the series log lined as a reformed gangster navigates a post rap navigates post rapture chaos, torn between his criminal inheritance and caring for a uh, child. All right. And go ahead. Yeah. And do you want me to go on with the pilot log line? Yeah, go ahead. Read the other one too. Okay. Cool. When the rapture tears away his baby mama and son and repentant gangster is, assume, is forced to assume his role as head of the family in order to protect himself and a child amidst gang rivalry. All right. Cool. Thanks for that. So this is about a gangster trying to maintain a sort of or build a new crime empire after the rapture. Is that right? Essentially. Well, so 
what I didn't go into context is, is like prior to this, he had just been released from prison and uh, he's coming out and assuming as soon when he comes out, something happens at the, like in the teaser of the pilot that forces him to like, okay, you're next in line for this, but mm-hmm. he's reformed out of prison and he doesn't necessarily want to take it. But when this happens, he's forced to kind of, you know, assume this power. He's forced to? Why is he forced to? Um, Essentially because the person who took the, we're going to air quote, throne, um, the person who took the throne in his absence essentially is raptured. And so with no one to left to assume power, he's basically forced to because there's other gangs trying to come in and take the territory. And basically they can't do that with him there. So they're trying to eliminate him. So he's forced to assume this power in order to protect himself. Okay, and he can't just leave. Why? He can't just leave because it basically in the world that they live in, it's kind of in poverty. It would be really hard for him to just up and just leave, the, you know, basically fresh out of prison uh, with nothing to his name, no family, because they've all been raptured as well. Don't you think maybe The Leftovers might be a good comp for this, considering that's like an HBO drama that takes place after a rapture type event? I've never seen The Leftovers, so that would be a that would be a good thing to mark down. That would certainly be a good comp um, for you. And let me ask: Is the tone? This is pretty serious. Yeah, this would be more so. Yeah, really super dramatic with you know undertones of certain certain you know comedy between like characters and dialogue, but overall the entire tone would be pretty serious. Okay, so The Leftovers and The Wire sounds like a good set of comps. It's an original idea. Um, you, the genres you've listed are crime, thriller, and anthology. How is this an anthology? An anthology because the thank you for being with us tag would be a running motif in the season of like this cult who basically is predicting the world is going to like be raptured and Judgment Day will come. Um, but essentially, each season would take place um, with a different cast of characters, but around the central event of basically where were you when the rapture happened. Okay, I would not describe that as an anthology. An anthology are usually going to be completely separate stories that are linked maybe by, like, the genre or something like that. Mm -hmm. And and so, and The Leftovers, by the way, has a similar idea where the different seasons have different central characters in the cast, so that is an even better comp, but no one describes The Leftovers as as an anthological so in any case, okay. this sounds like this is a crime slash. Maybe it, so. Let me ask: Are there more supernatural things that happen throughout the show, or is just are we in the the aftermath of a supernatural event? The aftermath of a supernatural event. Okay, so there's no more magic stuff. There's no more angels, demons, gods, or monsters. No, 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 no. Okay. No. In that case, um, I would just probably leave it as crime for now. I was gonna say crime slash fantasy, but um, if you yeah. if there are not more magic things happening, then it probably won't really feel like a fantasy show. Does it feel kind of post-apocalyptic? Uh, yeah, for the most part. And then I was imagining things become more sewage. But like for like the first half of this season, I kind of wanted it. I think um, one of the influences was uh, almost like I, I don't know. You're familiar with uh, Darren Aronofsky's like Mother, mm-hmm. but I was imagining like the mid like when after the inciting incident, whenever like that seal on that movie kind of breaks. I was imagining that's how like the pilot episode runs until it's like, you know, this consensus, he he suges the role, he takes everything. Um, He basically finds himself in a really safe position. And then we kind of go on with like the crime portion of it. But for the most part, uh, it kind of just suges, you know, society kind of falls back into the norm. Okay. So yeah, but you might even consider this post-apocalyptic. So we could say crime, post-apocalyptic crime show might be a good way to sort of phrase this. I guess it is literally mm. post-apocalypse, right? If the rapture is like yeah, yeah. Armageddon or whatever. But the world wasn't destroyed, you're saying? It was just like sort of the people get sucked up in the sky or whatever? Essentially, yeah. Pe- yeah, the world wasn't destroyed. People go up and whoever is, you know, here with us is just left behind. You know, no, no more hope or anything like that. I see, I see. Okay. So a crime show set in this sort of post-rapture world is is a strong idea, definitely. That's a, I would like to see that and you know, what in a world where money might not even matter anymore, what does crime look like? I'm interested in, in these things. Um, a reformed gangster navigates post-rapture chaos torn between his criminal inheritance and caring for a child. So criminal inheritance is kind of vague. Are you, he's, 
in charge of a crime empire, right? Essentially. And what sent him to jail is what also caused him to lose it. But whenever he comes out due to the rapture, he's kind of like the only one left that can handle this role. Okay. And what's his relationship to the child? This is a child that has kind of been left behind. Um, and he runs into them. And I was imagining there's like this little uh, father and son relationship, seeming that like his, it says in the pilot episode, like when the rapture turns away, his baby mom and son. Mm-hmm. Um, and he hasn't seen these people for like five years or however long he's been locked up. Um, and so he kind of skipped out on a major portion of his son's life. And so whenever he loses his son, this is kind of hit, like this child kind of serves as like almost like his redemption. Okay. Um, so there's like a conflicting between like, do I accept this role and potentially put myself in harm's way? Or do I, how do I navigate caring for a child and this? So something like, you might want to even frame it more like he has to, he's torn between his criminal empire and, you know, his his family, or maybe something like caring for his adopted son or something like that. Would just, even if that's not exactly what the dynamic is, that sort of is explaining why it's important to him, right? So you may just want to phrase yeah. it in such a way to emphasize what is the connection between them. If you just say caring for a child, it just means nothing to us. So make make it clear why it matters to the character. And then, Paul, uh-huh. when the rapture tears away his baby mama and son, a repentant gangster is forced to assume his role as the head of the family in order to protect himself. And again, a child just doesn't quite sound important. So I would say something more like, his adopted child, whatever it is, amidst gang rivalry. Um, yeah, I think I get it. Uh, so he's like high up in the organization, but isn't wasn't expecting to have to take over. I suppose you're saying, and then the yeah, fact, yeah, and okay, and then this just presents an opportunity where it's like, if you don't take over, the family will fall apart, and also people might hunt you down and kill you. Yes, bingo, right in the spot. Got it. Okay, I understand. Um. And uh, if you can maybe just find a little bit more of a specific objective for the pilot, so he has to assume his role as at the head of this family in order to fend off an attack from this gang or something like that, right? Or he needs to do this, like find out what is the specific tangible objective that he has to accomplish. Um, if that is, you know, some, he has to defend their territory, he has to take take somebody out or take over some turf, something like that, just paint for us a picture of what is the very first thing he has to do yeah and i have a question as well um so that essentially does happen in the pilot episode as soon as he uh before he's able to assume power when he's still in this gray area do i do it or do i not um there's a gang that comes in and basically tries to assassinate him it fails and that's what pushes him to accept the role mm-hmm. um so would i how would i frame that in the pilot log line um, but while still, you know, keeping the tearing away, his, like basically still keeping the elements of, you know, loss of his family, uh, him regaining a sense of like his family and a child, and as well as kind of framing this attack. How would I frame that in a pilot log line? So you're saying you know, within like twenty to fifty words. Sure, sure. So you're saying he has to protect himself, right? But that doesn't really have an end mm-hmm. date on it. That doesn't have like one thing you need to do to protect yourself. So I would ask yourself, does he have to survive until winter? Does he have to like, find a more concrete way of explaining what he has to actually do? So maybe it's in order to, he has to clear all the enemy gangs from his turf, right? Something like uh-huh. that, right? That would, when you do that, you will have protected yourself. You will have eliminated the threat. So you may have to just make the threat a little more tangible, right? Does he have to survive three yeah. assassination attempts before they're done? Does he have to find the three assassins? Does he have to, you know, I'm just naming random stuff. But this is just yeah. like an example of how you can take an intangible objective, protect yourself, and make it tangible. You have to give, go- you have to put goalposts along the way, and allow your character to say like, once I do that specific thing, I will have accomplished the goal. Okay, so essentially just being more specific and you know descriptive. Yeah, more specific objective in the pilot logline will go very far and do a lot of the work for you. Okay. Cool. 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 Any questions? Uh, no, I think I'm good. I think you summed it up pretty really well. Great. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. It was well. All right, let's keep going. Luke, are you still here? Hello. Gonna be late. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I did a rewrite that I'd like some feedback on. Sure, go ahead and read uh, that for us. This is the series logline. The, the pilot logline is uh, hasn't changed, and it's not ready. Um, I, I'd read it if, I kept, if you could stop moving it around, please. Oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, when a deceased work dodger is resurrected in deep space with a mad doctor, a brainless captain, and an alien intruder, he must save the ship from interplanetary crises while trying to earn earn enough credit certificates to die. Earn <laughs> enough credit certificates to die. That's a pretty funny uh, long line. Um, let me make sure I understand. So, what's a work dodger? Um, uh, someone who is chronically slacking off on the job, uh, shirking their duties, um, doing the bare minimum amount of work, sort of putting their duties off on other people. Would you say a slacker? Yeah, I would. That's why I chose work dodger because I don't like the word slacker for that. It's it's less apt than work dodger. <laughs> okay, I'm just not sure that's a phrase I've heard in the world before. Work <laughs> I mean, I kind of get what you mean, but I think most people would just say slacker in, in in this case. When a deceased slacker is resurrected in deep space with a by the mad doctor or with a mad doctor, whom is he resurrected by? Uh. Like, the computer, mainly. Um, the Mad Doctor facilitates part of the procedure. Um, it's mainly the ship re resuscitating him. Um, okay, that you might, explain it? Yeah, that does. So you might want to include that. So when he's resurrected on board of an intelligent AI, or, or whatever, however you want to phrase it, like, when an okay. out-of-control AI ship resurrects him on board, something like that, right? So the ship gotcha. causes this. And that, and that would, would yeah, because yeah, I, I mentioned the ship, ship later. later. And would, yeah, okay. Yeah, but this clarifies why it actually happened in the first place. So he's resurrected by the ship in space, and these are just the other captives on board. Do I before I answer that? Do I need to include his death as like the inciting incident, or should I just? Um, I would understand his resurrection as the inciting incident because you. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, um, I think I. So get what was, what was the question again? Are these the other crew members? The doctor, the captain, the alien intruder? Or are those... kind of like the main, the other main, like, cast members. Right, but so are they the, are they other people that have been resurrected on the same ship? Uh, not all of them have been resurrected, but they're all on the same ship, uh, working with various contracts that they can't get out of either. Okay. And he must save the ship from interplanetary crises while trying to earn enough credit certificates to die. If he doesn't save the ship from the crises, wouldn't he just die anyway? Um, God damn, that is a great, excellent problem that I have to solve with the slug line. Um, so... I guess if he dies, he'll just be resurrected again. Okay. And again, and again and again and again until he pays his debt off or whatever. So yeah, it, can the ship be destroyed? Or can the ship be destroyed? Um, potentially, and that could be a funny episode to have them try to destroy the ship. Uh, Seems like their best bet, especially if it's facing massive crises. It would all the time. be it would be incredibly difficult to do. Okay. Um. So I guess there's a there's your first little paradox or, or, or question or whatever is if it's his job to save the ship from significant crises, then it's not actually his job. It's just something he has to do because no one else does. And basically the brainless captain takes the credit every time. Hmm. Um, so it's, so it it's sounds... just a situation he's been thrust into where there's a sci-fi problem of the week that he ultimately has to be the one to solve. Right, because he's stuck with a bunch of uh, people, constant infighting, and yeah, that's the whole thing. And what happens and if, I think if he fails work through the whole series? What What happens if he what just does? Question? What happens if he fails or does nothing? If he fails or does nothing, um, well, if he fails or does nothing, he's just gonna be stuck there, and he's it's never gonna improve. His situation's gonna 
deteriorate. So uh, if he wants to get out or improve his situation in any way, he's going to have to do something. Uh, but so is it that the crises would just make life on the ship worse? Or is it that they actually threaten the ship or its crew in some significant way? Oh, um, it's kind of all of the above. It's kind of, it can plan it. It can uh, threaten a planet. It can threaten the ship. It can threaten a specific crew member. Um, you know, their food supply. It's just a, a problem of the week kind of thing. Right. But to me, the premise would be a little clearer if it were something like, he has to, like, I understand that his goal is earn enough credit certificates or whatever to die, right? But that the problems coming up weren't things that thre existentially threatened uh, either all the crew members or all of the function of the ship itself, because then it would simply be to your main character's advantage to simply let those things happen. I think if it was more like, the ship is now being invaded by, I don't know, space cockroaches, right? And you have to resolve that, or else now the ship now you live on a ship that's infested with cockroaches, rather than the ship is going to be eaten by a space cockroach. Does that does that does that make sense? How the scale of the problem might kind of, uh, or like tuning the scale of the problems might make the. I don't understand, understand the analogy, analogy at all. Um, if the or, or how, if the scale of the problem is maybe? if the scale of the problems is so large that it threatens the it, like the antagonist of the show, which is the ship, then it's to your main character's benefit to simply let the bad things happen, right? Oh, uh, potentially, yeah, that, that would be true. So if you phrase the, so, the sort of recurring conflict here as less interplanetary crises and more like things that threaten the day-to-day -day life on the ship, or maybe they're just like, I don't know, there's a gross smell in the vents, and now unless you solve that, you're going to live in a more miserable condition than you are now. I think that if you, if you frame it as every episode is going to be some massive crisis, then it starts to become unclear either why your main character well, should act or so, how they would act. Go ahead. If you remember the old log line I had, interplanetary crises juxtaposed against unclogging snack machines, like mm -hmm. to sort of show the spectrum. Uh, I, I cut that for brevity, and I think this phrase has to kind of carry both. So, um, what's a good one or two word phrase that means sci fi problem of the week that could just be? Uh, you know, uh, uh, a microbe in the rice supply, or it could be, uh, you know, a, a black hole devouring a solar system, and you got to save uh, a civilization. You know, that kind of thing. I would sci-fi problem with the week. I would look more at the middle of the long line then. So he must something like he must perform both unpleasant chores and, or, or he would say something like, you know, here's two examples of things that he has to do in order to achieve his goal, which is earning enough credits in order to die. So you're saying I need both? I can't just do it in one? can't have um, one blanket just... term for Star Trek episodic problems? Like, uh... I guess you could. I mean, you could say something like, he must uh, help maintain the ship in order to earn enough credits to, to die or something like that. I'm not 100% well, sure. Sounds like, that just sounds like he's doing, like, welding or something on it. Mm -hmm. Uh... Well, is or, it that he gets more credits when there's a bigger problem or something like that? He he doesn't get any credits for he, the problems um, are solved, and he doesn't get any payment or recognition for helping solve them. It's kind of the running joke. Oh, then why, um, do, why do, in the logline do you say he has to do this in order to earn credits? Well, the credits he's earning through his like job, like unclogging snack machines and. Uh, you know, corporate drudgery and that kind of thing. Oh, so he doesn't need to, to save the ship from anything then in that case, right? He just needs to do his job and keep his head down. Um, well, well, how, how can, can you, you do, do your job, job and keep, keep your head, head down, down if, you know, you know the, the sun is, is going, going to destroy the office if the boss doesn't, uh, you know, draw the office curtains and, but, but the boss is too busy, busy. um, or the boss, boss is like on vacation, vacation or something like that. that. But you like, want the you office to be destroyed. That's his goal, is to die. Right? Okay, well. <laughs> um, destroy the entire ship, ship not, uh, is, is, is really, really difficult. difficult. If, if he just 
does, if he just lets the, like, everyone die, the ship will bring them back, and the, 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 the whole thing will start over again. Like, I feel like we're talking in circles about this. I, I kind of see what you're saying, but um, do, you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, the ship is is like a city. It is a self-sustaining, um, like, fortress, basically. Mm -hmm. with expendable crew that can just be like rebuilt from scratch as needed mm -hmm. um so yeah it, those those ones that might actually destroy the ship that come up rarely maybe he would actually actively try to have the ship be destroyed um but otherwise he, he has to do something do you see what I'm saying? Um, but his, but what he's, but so yeah, the, but the thing that you're phrasing the character doing in the logline usually is in service of achieving their main goal, right? I see. And so, so if it's, sa saving the, or like, you know, saving the ship from these crises, that's not actually earning him credits to die. That's actually working but against it's part his of main the, goal. It's, it's part, part of the premise of the show. Of the show. Like, like, how, how do I include, include that? that? That's, that's like, like the, the meat and potatoes, potatoes of the show. show. Um, that no, no one wants to see him just doing drudgery and paying the bills, like, but even though that's part of it, um, how do I... It might just I mean, be an issue with the premise itself, I'm not sure. Oh my god, I've rewritten this thing too many times. I just, I'm just gonna chuck it in the fire. Uh, I'm, I'm late. I'm so late. Oh my god, and I hate this. I hate everything. I, I was behind by like four milliseconds, and I'm like 45 minutes late. Oh okay. my god, okay. We can talk more on this anyway. soon. Yeah, don't worry. Um, feel free to bring it to a lab or any other workshop or class, and we can get more into it. But um, hope this is at least giving you some things to think about for now. Uh, sure. I, I will think about it. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. Adios. All right, thanks so much for sharing. So um, we are almost at the end of our time. So I think I will just have time to do one more for now. Um, but we have many other opportunities on the server to get feedback. We've got script swaps three times a week. We've got readings multiple times a week. We've got many different channels for feedback and for sharing and for you know um, swapping with others. So definitely try to, if, if you are, if you would really like to be in the uh, pilot class moving forward, you can either sign up and then send me a message or tag me and I can review your logline before next week. Or if um, you are not sure, you can always just spend this next week, work on the loglines and on the setup for the show as best you can. And then for next weekend, um, make sure you sign up before that class. Um, for anyone wondering how to sign up, again, if you're still with us, Thank you for being here. Scriptcamp.net is the website to go to. You'll scroll down to Unlimited, and you can enroll there, or say 40% if you subscribe yearly. All right, I will take one last um, log line, and then anything else that you guys wanted feedback on this week will be a fine time for you to do that. Let's look at Charlie's script, Alterity. Hello. Hi. All right. We have a sci-fi um, detective type show, it looks like. Why don't you read out what you have here for us? Um, so the, the series logline is, after EMP is down the global grid, igniting the Great War of 2000 to 2018, the UK recovers under a new draconian direction. OK, and the pilot? When his family are threatened, a hustler with a head for numbers must track down an aristocrat and convince her to return to her affluent borough before his illegal business is destroyed. All right, thanks for that. So, um, crime drama. Uh, okay, so you have not included sci-fi as one of your comps here. That kind of tells us that there's not going to be more science fiction-y stuff throughout the rest of the show, is that right? Um, it's not really science fiction, no. It's more, um, like, when I have 
altered com carbon as the comp. It's more aesthetically, like there's the juxtaposition of a late Victorian and Edwardian aesthetic for the affluent society and like the working class to poverty stricken live almost in like a dystopian early stage cyberpunk aesthetic. Um, so that's more so the reason for those comps because visually that's uh, the backdrop to the story. Okay. Um, maybe something like Mr. Robot would be a little bit more down to earth and like early stage cyber cyberpunk. I'll see. Yeah, I'll, I'll take a look at that and see. Altered Carbon is a very, very sci-fi choice and that kind of tells us that the world itself would have some sci-fi elements built built into it so i'd probably not use that one 71 i've not heard of um maybe that works but in, in any case um just trying to figure out what you're trying to make this is why comps are important mm -hmm. uh, all right log line so after emps down the global grid igniting the great war of 2008 to 2018 the uk recovers under a new draconian direction so who is the cast of the characters um so, so beginning, beginning the, the protagonist, protagonist would be daniel, daniel. Um, he is the, the hustler. Mm -hmm. There is, it's a sort of ensemble cast for the series, but you do have like a main protagonist. Um, but people will come in and out like during the season. It's uh, definitely an ensemble. So I didn't name everyone that you come across. Um, but when you say the UK, just most... does that mean like the characters are going to be politicians? Um, well, no, because oh, you'll come across some politicians, you'll come across, like, so in 71, one of the comps, it's basically about, like, the troubles with the IRA during that time, and there's those elements within the story, so there's, um, like, former politicians, there are criminal elements, there's this guy, there's this girl, um, you know, there are people in these neighborhoods, or the boroughs, which are more segregated, than they were prior to the war because of this alternative timeline element. So, um, yeah, you you kind of meet all aspects of the society throughout the season and get a glimpse into this alternative uh, reality. Okay, so it's a true cross section of life. Are there some people in government, yes. some civilians, some rich, some poor, and like just all exactly? Of them? Right? Really? Okay. Yeah, um, that sounds incredibly challenging to balance or to make that work, but maybe. Maybe you do. Um, and if that is truly the case, maybe the UK is actually just the best way to phrase what, what you're doing here. Normally, I would say something like, you know, um, the like uh, the the you would you would try to narrow the scope a little bit. Right. So you'd say something like um, in a in a United Kingdom recovering from an apocalyptic event, one group of, uh, you know, one, the cabinet of the president try to make things we try to pull the country together, right? Because that would sort of narrow the focus to, oh, okay, it's not those people. But if you're really saying it actually is taking place all over the country with people that are not connected to each other, that are of all different roles and functions and training and background and everything like that, maybe this is just a very broad ensemble about the entire country. Um, maybe something like Children of Men would be a good comp. Have you seen that one? I have. It's been a while. That's, uh, that... Uh, yes, in some sense, it is like that. Like, you have the protagonist, and he's forced into this uh, task, which essentially he comes across all these different people with all these different agendas. It works very well, yeah. Okay. Let's look at the pilot. So when his family are threatened... So we normally say his family is threatened. His family members yeah. are threatened. Family is singular. So when his family is threatened, a hustler with a head for numbers, great, must track down an aristocrat and convince her to return to her affluent, affluent borough before his illegal business is destroyed. So, his, is it his business or his family that's been threatened? I guess you're saying it's both. Yeah, first his family is threatened, and then if he doesn't follow through, because he gets hired to do the job inadvertently, basically, but he kind of brushes it off. Mm -hmm. And so then his family is threatened to get his attention, and then if he doesn't follow through with doing the job, they threaten his livelihood, which happens to be illegal businesses. Isn't that a step down from threatening someone's family, though? Um, no, not really. Not for him. <laughs> so they start by threatening his family, then that doesn't work, so they're like, okay, I guess we'll destroy your business? Something seems off. Um, no, so initially the, he's hired for a job and he brushes it off, and so they threaten his family to get his attention, and you find out that the reason that he has all these illegal businesses is essentially to better his family's lot in life, so it's... 
by threatening the businesses, he is also, they're also threatening his family's livelihood. And um, the threat on his family is indirect. It's not like someone pulls a gun out on his parents. It's like um, the way the mob, you know, would threaten someone. Um, maybe they leave something to let you know, like, I know where your family lives type of thing. Like, like do the job or do what I asked you to do. Or maybe I come back again and visit your family kind of thing um it's not a direct physical threat to his family it's more um subtle initially okay but do, do you still see what i'm getting at though is that you start with the high stakes threat we it's weird to then at the end say before his business gets destroyed if you start by saying his family's threatened then you've set the stakes pretty high and then from then on you have to i would it's weird to downgrade them by the end of the logline. So I would maybe flip them around. When his business is threatened, a okay. hustler with a head for numbers must track down the aristocrat and convince her to return before the gangsters who are threatening him move on to his family. Does that make sense that that's actually escalating as opposed to de-escalating? Um, I see how it could be perceived that way, yes. Okay. Most people value their family more than their business it's kind of very unusual you're right most people do yeah. <laughs> okay it would be very unusual for a character to value money and their business over their family if so right that, that's just where i'd start with this so probably flip these around and then second what's going to be difficult about convincing a woman to return to her bro or is this just going to be he has to just talk to her like what actual what actual um, challenge is standing in the way yeah, so um, he does have to convince her because the way that the society is set up, he doesn't have access to just take her back. Like, he needs to use his charm, his manipulation, his intellect, which usually serves him well, but it doesn't really work on her. So he has to figure out how to persuade her to go home because he has no means of just making her do it um, but, because of the caste in society. There's, yeah. like, there's no way for him to throw her in the back of the car and take her home like he wouldn't be permitted entry into the place like her status is such that he is automatically subservient to her okay okay but because so, of but, their, but, their cast in life but so is there more to this than he just goes there and talks to somebody for the whole episode like what else gets in the way anything um no so the first the pilot's more like setting up the kind of the, the world building and giving you a glimpse of him and then the threats that take place so the interactions the the juxtapositions of these two worlds and then him meeting her um would be like the first half of the pilot so um that would be the setup for it um he does have to talk to her and again it's just the the juxtaposition of these two worlds and um, in meeting, they actually, like, I guess you would say, like, a, a romance sparks. So oh, it's, okay. like, uh, unexpected romance. That would sort of seem to make your character's journey easier rather than more difficult, right? I guess it's harder in a certain sense, but it would make it easier to convince someone well, to go with you. Um, It would make it easier to convince her to go home if she liked him back, yes. And, um... There's also that juxtaposition of if she goes back, they can't be together because he's not permitted entry into the life that she lives because he's in lower... Yeah. Okay. So just if there is any other aspect to the conflict here, then you just want to make uh -huh. it clear how it's not... This is more than just a pilot about a guy sitting in a room talking to a lady, right? So it could be that you need to emphasize there's people after her, right? And they need to avoid them together. She's being pursued or chased. Maybe it's something like if he has to constantly deal with threats against his own family or business, so maybe they're escalating those threats as he takes too long to accomplish his task or something like that. Right. right. So whatever okay. it is, just in terms of whatever challenge is standing, however it's going to escalate, I think is what we would kind of like to see implied in the pilot log line. Okay. It's a good setup, though. I mean, I like the world, and the I can see how just having to get this lady to come back could take up the entire episode but I, if that is the case we want to know what the conflict is besides just she's like no and he's like but you should and she's like but i won't <laughs> like it, what external factors besides that are adding pressure to your main character okay hope that's clear and then yeah yes. I, in terms of <laughs> in terms of comps sherlock holmes might not be the right idea exactly either just because that's a detective procedural where the main character solves a case of the week is this a case of the week kind of show um, it kind of is for him. Like I said, once you set him up, you kind of see, like, um, 
he's into like racketeering. He does odd jobs. He kind of hustles on the sidelines. Um, and he does like detective work because he does have like a military background. Mm -hmm. And so he has the ability to, to kind of work in the shadows, um, which is set up. It's established early on with his personality and some of the jobs people come and offer him. You, you get the sense like, okay, he kind of does odd jobs, including detective work. Yeah. Um, It sounds like he's more of a Jack of all trades. So I would maybe look and see if you can find another show that has more of that kind of sense to it, where the character is just kind of scrappy doing whatever they can to get by Sometimes mm-hmm. there's, they might fight crime here and there, but only because it benefits them, that sort of thing. Whereas uh-huh. Sherlock Holmes is more like the prototypical detective show, right? This is not a traditional de- detective show. Um, so there may be another comp out there that just fits a little better. I would just stay flexible. Okay. Questions? No, as ever, you're very helpful. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, so um, we do have to wrap up because we're 10 minutes over. We do have a couple more that I was not able to get to just in the runtime. So uh, thank you guys so much for sharing those. We will have plenty of opportunities for you to get feedback this upcoming week if you'd like to get more before the next class. But the goal is basically before the end of the next class to have finalized the logline as best you can. Um, we will leave up the upcoming schedule so you guys can see we'll, we will be running next Sunday from 10 to noon, same deal as today. And here are the upcoming boot camp dates. So this one's going to run for six weeks. We also have feature boot camp that starts December, started December 1st. That's ongoing, but not too late to join. Novel boot camp every Saturday, 12 to 2. And we have Writer's Lab Saturdays from 4 to 6 on Script Camp. All right, thank you so much, guys. We do still have a poll up in the chat. If you're planning to sign up or are not sure or have questions, you can click on those little numbers there to let us know. Nacho, anything else you want to share before we head out today? Uh, yeah, just um, Table Reads is starting in about two hours. And then right after Table Reads, we have um, Comedy Writers Group. This is a new group that's just started on Sundays. Great. So here's the uh, upcoming class schedule. We hope to see you guys soon for your next one. And if you're persisting with TV writing, then keep working, keep filling out that sketchbook, refine your logline as much as you can, or you can get feedback on it this week if you need to. If you're a member, you can get one-on-one feedback from me if you just post in the Loglines with Connor channel if you want to. If you just want feedback from anybody, you can just post in feedback, up to you. But in any case, try to work on that as much as you can before next week and fill out the sketchbook with all the ideas that you have for scenes, characters, locations, moments, endings, things like that, and uh, be ready to pick it up next week. We'll give it a last look if you feel it's not quite ready yet in next week's class, but we want to finish with log lines by the end of next Sunday. Thank you guys so much. Hope that you got some good stuff out of this class and are excited and ready to move forward with your next pilot. All right, have a great rest of your weekend, guys, and we'll see you soon for your next Script Camp event.